Previously, in the RH saga, we talked about how L functions can be constructed from what I like to call primal objects. The three most important types of primal objects are automorphic representations, motives, and Galois representations. Here I also want to mention flat schemes. Schemes is another language for talking about polynomial equations. And flat means that we think of these equations mod p for all primes p, or at least all except a finite number. Two of the main immortal dreams connected to L functions would be to prove the Riemann hypothesis and resolve further cases of the Langlands program, including the two major themes of the main branch, namely functoriality and reciprocity. For us, the ultimate meta-dream, so to speak, is to find a new theory or new language called F1 geometry that could open up some of the seemingly impossible barriers to these immortal problems. Today, we will revisit the Riemann hypothesis, not just for the Riemann zeta function, but for our new motivic and automorphic examples of L functions. The examples we looked at in the story of Langland's reciprocity were these. We had the equation k, x squared plus 1 equals 0. This is a one variable equation, so it defines what's called a number field, which can be thought of either as a motive or a scheme. The L function of k was 1, 1, 0, 1, 2, 0, 0, 1, and so on. And we managed to express this L function in terms of a simple automorphic object, let's call it A for automorphic, given by the periodic pattern 1, 0, minus 1, 0, repeating over and over again. We also had the equation E, y squared plus xy plus y, equals x cubed minus x. And we express the L function of E also in terms of a modular form, which was this generating series related to a combinatorial problem of counting certain coin combinations. The simplest equation of all would be x equals 0. Let's label it with a p, since its solution is always a single point in any number system, or mod p for any prime number p. This equation also has an L function, and this is the Riemann zeta function. All in all, this means that we now have four different L functions. The Riemann zeta function coming from P, the L function coming from K, and this is the Dedekind zeta function of a number field. We have the L function coming from E, this is the L function of an elliptic curve, and finally, the L function of A, which is the L function of a Dirichlet character. This is the periodic pattern in itself. In the future, when we need more examples, we can go to the LMFDB, pick the kind of objects we are interested in, for example, an elliptic curve, a number field, or a Dirichlet character, and explore thousands of other examples in a similar 
fashion. In GRH, the RH stands for Riemann hypothesis, and the G stands for generalized, or grand, or great, or glorious, or glittery, or some other superlative of your choice. In any case, the G means that we consider not only the Riemann zeta function, but some more general class of L functions. I'd like to talk about the GRH, but before we can do that, we must say something about analytic continuation. Say I have an L function defined by the coefficient sequence a1, a2, a3, and so on. To recap, for p, this would be 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. For k, it is 1, 1, 0, 1, 2, 0, and so on. For e, it starts with 1, minus 1, minus 2, 1, 0, 2. And for a, it's this periodic pattern, 1, 0, minus 1, 0, repeating indefinitely. Given the sequence of coefficients, the actual L function is a1 over 1 to the s, plus a2 over 2 to the s, plus a3 over 3 to the s, and so on. Let's take k just to have a concrete example. Here's the sequence. Now, the Dirichlet series looks like this. Some terms are zero and disappear. The first term is always just one. You could find the same Dirichlet series in the LMFDB if you go to number fields, degree two, choose the label for x squared plus one, and then click on L function on the right. The problem here, and it's the same for every L function, is that this series has absolute convergence only in a certain right half plane. In this case, if the real part of S is larger than one. Concretely, I can take any complex number in this right half plane, for example, the real number S equals two, plug it in and just compute the infinite series as one plus one over two square plus one over four square, plus two over five square, and so on. Here, the terms get smaller and smaller in absolute value, fast enough so that the entire series converges to some specific number. In this case, approximately 1.5067. If I take a complex number outside of the right half plane, then either the series is conditionally convergent, so you can't rearrange the terms without creating a mess. Or it's just divergent, meaning it is seemingly undefined. Before we can even talk about the Riemann hypothesis, we need to extend the function so that it's defined in the entire complex plane, except possibly for some isolated points where it may go off to infinity. Such an extension to the complex plane is called an analytic continuation of the L function. For many L functions, it's known that an analytic continuation exists. In particular, if you can prove that a given L function comes from an automorphic object, then it's a theorem that it has an analytic continuation. This is actually one of the main motivations for Langland's reciprocity. For our four examples, since they all do come from automorphic objects in some way, they all have an analytic continuation. 
If you for some reason don't want to use automorphic objects, another approach to analytic continuation would be to look for some explicit series or integral that converges in the entire complex plane and agrees with the Dirichlet series in the right half plane. Just to show one example of this, the Riemann zeta function zeta of s is 1 plus 1 over 2 to the s plus 1 over 3 to the s and so on. This is valid when the real part of s is bigger than 1. But we can also write zeta of s as 1 over s minus 1 plus 1 half plus 2 times the integral from 0 to infinity of sine of 2 arctan t over 1 plus t square to the power s over 2 times e to the 2 pi t minus 1. And the integration variable here is t. Here, for any given s in the entire complex plane, except s equals 1. For example, s equals 2 or s equals minus 1 or any s value in the critical strip, I can plug the s value into the formula and then I have a very concrete integral I can compute numerically to get that specific Riemann zeta value. As an example, for s equals 2, the function we integrate looks like this. The integral is this area, and then we get the value zeta of 2. Similarly, for s equals minus 1, the function we integrate looks like this, and the area is here. Since each of our four L functions does have analytic continuation, we can look for zeros in the complex plane. Recall that the Riemann zeta function had trivial zeros at minus 2, minus 4, minus 6, and so on, and non trivial zeros which from numerical evidence seem to lie exactly on the critical line, meaning they have real part one half. We can write the non-trivial zeros as one half plus i times t, and the sequence of t values, t1, t2, t3, and so on, in the upper half plane is, by definition, the spectrum. The first few spectrum values for the Riemann zeta function were 14.13, 21.02, 25.01, and so on. For the L function of A, there are trivial zeros at minus 1, minus 3, minus 5, and so on. The non-trivial zeros, again, seem to lie on the critical line. And now the spectrum begins with 6.02, 10.24, 12.99, and 18.29. For the L function of k, there are trivial zeros at minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, minus 4, and so on. Again, the non-trivial zeros seem to be on the line, but look at the spectrum. It starts out with 6.02, 10.24, 
12.24, 12.99, and then 14.13, 16.34, 18.29, and 21.02. What is going on here? We have seen all of these numbers before. Some of them come from the spectrum of P, the Riemann zeta, and all the others come from the spectrum of A. In fact, it's the same for the trivial zeros. Maybe you recall that we could express the L function of K in terms of the Riemann zeta together with the periodic L function of A. And this is just another reflection of that same correspondence. Finally, for E, there is a slight twist to the story, in that the right half plane of absolute convergence starts at three halves instead of one. And the critical line is also shifted to real part one rather than one half. The trivial zeros in this case are all the negative integers, and the non-trivial zeros indeed seem to lie on the critical line. Recall that we used the spectrum of the Riemann zeta function, t1, t2, t3, to form these cosine waves. f of x equals minus cosine of t1 log x, minus cosine of t2 log x, and so on. With lots of terms in the sum, we obtained these spikes at prime numbers, together with smaller spikes at the other prime powers. Now, Let's do the same thing for the other L functions. For K, we get these waves. The spikes seem to be at 5, 9, 13, and 17. What on earth is going on here? So k was constructed from the Gaussian integers. And if you look at these primes, something very special happens. A prime is, by definition, a number that cannot be factored, unless one of the factors is, is 1. But in the Gaussian integers, we can compute 2 plus i times 2 minus i, that is 2 squared minus i squared, so that's 4 minus minus 1, 4 plus 1, that's 5. So in the world of Gaussian integers, the world where k comes from, the prime number 5 can be factored. So it's not a true prime, it's kind of a fake prime. Similarly, we can compute 2 plus 3i times 2 minus 3i, and that is 13. 1 plus 4i times 1 minus 4i turns out to be 17. So what the L function of k tells you, or rather the spectrum of the L function, is that certain primes decompose or factor in the world of Gaussian integers. For A, we have these spikes, and I leave it to you to think about what this could mean.
Finally, for E, this is the way. There are negative spikes at 3 and 13, a small positive one at 7, and then this huge heartbeat of love for the prime 17. Why? Recall that we counted the solutions mod p for the equation e, for different primes p. For the prime 2, we had three solutions. For the prime 3, we had five solutions, and so on. For most primes, uh, like 5 uh, or 7, the number of solutions is approximately the same as the prime itself. But for 13, the number of solutions is much larger than the prime. And for 17, the number of solutions is much smaller. So there is some kind of connection here between the solutions to the equation and the spectrum of the L function. To summarize, we can search for the zeros of any L function, and except for the trivial zeros, they always seem to lie on the critical line. And this conjecture for all L functions is known as GRH, the Generalized Riemann Hypothesis. No one can prove this even for a single L function. Each L function seems to tell its own story about the primes. The Riemann zeta function just tells you where all the primes are. The L function of K tells you which primes can be factored in the world of Gaussian integers. And the last L function, for E, had this heartbreaking crush on the prime number 17. And we can maybe guess that this connects to the solutions mod 17 that sort of should be there, but somehow have gone missing from this world. There is a sense that primes are generating this unspeakably beautiful music, and somehow each distinct L function brings forth its own theme or harmony within this epic infinite choir of primes. We humans have only a very limited and partial understanding of what L functions are, how the primes and the L functions interact in a dialectical process or cosmic dance. So far, the concept of L function has remained undefined, but next time we will say something more precise about how we could define formally exactly what an L function is. Today's book recommendation is this, Music of the Primes by Marcus du Sautoy. It's not so much about general L functions, it focuses on the Riemann zeta, but there are many beautiful stories and lots of interesting motivation and historical background to the Riemann hypothesis.